Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our net asset purchases. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we confirm that we will continue to make purchases under the asset purchase program at the current monthly pace of 80 billion euros until the end of this month, and that from April 2017 our net asset purchases are intended to continue at a monthly pace of 60 billion euros until the end of December 2017 or beyond if necessary, and in any case until the Governing Council sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with its inflation aim. The net purchases will be made alongside reinvestments of the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP. Our monetary measures and monetary policy measures conti have continued to preserve the very favorable financing conditions that are necessary to secure a sustained convergence of inflation rates towards level below, but close to 2% over the medium term. Their ongoing pass through to the borrowing conditions for firms and households benefits credit creation and supports the steadily firming recovery of the euro area economy. Sentiment indicators suggest that the cyclical recovery may be gaining momentum. Headline inflation has again increased, largely on account of rising energy and food price inflation. However, underlying inflation pressures continue to remain subdued. The Governing Council will continue to look through changes in HICP inflation if judged to be transient and to have no implication for the medium-term outlook for price stability. A very substantial degree of monetary accommodation is still needed for underlying inflation pressures to build up and support headline inflation in the medium term. If the outlook becomes less favorable, or if financial conditions become inconsistent with further progress towards a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation, we stand ready to increase our asset purchase program in terms of size and or duration. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.4% quarter on quarter in the fourth quarter of 2016, following a similar pace of growth in the third quarter. Incoming data, notably survey results, increase our confidence that the ongoing economic expansion will continue to firm and broaden. The pass-through of our monetary policy measures is supporting domestic demand and facilitates the ongoing deleveraging process. The recovery in investment continues to be promoted by very favorable financing conditions and improvements in corporate profitability. Moreover, rising employment which is also benefiting from past structural reforms, is having a positive impact on households' real disposable income, thereby providing support for private consumption. 
Also, there are signs of somewhat stronger global recovery and increasing global trade. However, economic growth in the euro area is expected to be dampened by a sluggish pace of implementation of structural reforms and remaining balance sheet adjustment needs, balance sheet adjustment needs in a number of sectors. This assessment is broadly reflected in the March 2017 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area, which foresee annual real GDP increasing by 1.8% in 2017, by 1.7% 1 in 2018, and by 1.6% 1 in 2019. Compared with the December 2016 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for real GDP growth has been revised upwards slightly in 2017 and 2018. The risks surrounding the euro era growth outlook have become less pronounced, but remain tilted to the downside and relate predominantly to global factors. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, Euro area annual HICP inflation increased further to 2% in February, up from 1.8% in January 2017 and 1.1% in December 2016. This reflected mainly a strong increase in annual energy and unprocessed food price inflation, with no signs yet of a convincing upward trend in underlying inflation. Headline inflation is likely to remain at levels close to 2% in the coming months, largely reflecting movements in the annual rate of change of energy prices. Measures of underlying inflation, however, have remained low and are expected to rise only gradually over the medium term. Supported by our monetary policy measures, the expected continuing economic recovery, and the corresponding gradual absorption of slack. This pattern is also reflected in the March 2017 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area which foresee annual HICP inflation at 1.7% in 2017, 1.6% in 2018, and 1.7% 1 in 2019. By comparison with the December 2016 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for headline HICP inflation has been revised upwards significantly for 2017 and slightly for 2018, while remaining unchanged for 2019. The staff projections are conditional on the full implementation of all our policy measures. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3 continues to expand a robust pace with an annual rate of growth of 4.9% in January 2017 after 5% in December 2016. As in previous months, annual growth in M3 was mainly supported by its most liquid components with a narrow monetary aggregate M1 expanding at an annual rate of 8.4 in January this year after 8.8% in December 2016. Loan dynamics followed the path of gradual recovery observed since the beginning of 2014. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations was 2.3% in January 2017 as in the previous month. The annual growth rate of loans to households was 2.2% in January 2017, after 2% in December 2016. 
Although developments in bank credit continue to reflect the lagged relationship with the business cycle, credit risk, and the ongoing adjustment of financial and non-financial sector balance sheets, the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 are significantly supporting borrowing conditions for firms and households, and thereby credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed the need for a continued, very substantial degree of monetary accommodation to secure a sustained return of inflation rates towards levels that are below but close to 2% without undue delay. In order to rip the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute much more decisively to strengthening economic growth. The implementation of structural reforms needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost potential output growth. Against the background of overall limited implementation of country-specific recommendations in 2016, greater reform effort is necessary in all euro area countries in 2017. Regarding fiscal policies, all countries should intensify efforts towards achieving a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. A full and consistent implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact and of the macroeconomic imbalances procedure over time and across countries remains crucial to ensure confidence in the EU's governance framework. We are now at your disposal for questions. Mr. Special. Alessandro Speciale, Bloomberg News. Um, Mr. President, in uh, January, you outlined four criteria uh, for the sus to describe the sustained adjustment path of inflation. Um, could you give us a progress report, how far y you feel you are in fulfilling each one of those? And um, there has also been a debate about uh, introducing a small change to the forward guidance uh, that is removing a clause that says that you are still ready to lower rates if needed. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, this clause is still in place. So could you explain to us why and if there has been a debate on this passage? Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me give you the substance of the discussion we had uh, at this governing council. And in so doing, I'll also answer your points. The first, it's actually been built, if one wants to summarize it, uh, if it's been built on three blocks. The first one is the acknowledgement of success. Namely, our monetary policy has been successful. And uh, let me give you just a few numbers of why we say that and how do we measure this success. Since 2015, real GDP growth has been steady at between 0.3 and 0.6% quarter on quarter. The economic sentiment index in February this year is the highest since 2011. The PMI Composite Output Index, this again February 2017, is the highest since April 2011. The unemployment rate in January was 9.6. It's the lowest since May 2009. Employment-like, employment-wise, well, I said last time that being in the last three years, four, mo four million jobs being created. Now, in fact, it's more than four million jobs because there have been a revision 
in the number of employment, uh, uh, number of employment figures in Germany of recent. So it's even more than 4 million. And uh, by the way, incidentally, in, uh, in just uh, giving you these numbers about employment, let me add that those who had doubts about the equity of our asset purchase program uh, are being answered because the most equitable measure of all is to create employment and to decrease unemployment. The recovery broadened further in the last quarter last year across sectors and across countries. And the interesting thing, which is continuing, I think I remarked about that last time, is that the dispersion of value-added growth across countries reached an all-time low. In other words, countries seem to grow more together. An all-time low since 1997. Uh, if we go, if we move to deflation, to inflation, I would say that risks of deflation have largely disappeared. Market-based inflation expectations have increased noticeably. Also, those at longer-term horizons, even though they are still below the level that is considered to be uh, to be adequate for pronouncing victory on the inflation front. The financing conditions and credit demand have continued to improve. Lending rates for households and companies have declined significantly, more by more than our key interest rates. The cross-country heterogeneity, you remember the time when we had fragmentation, we had countries where our lower interest rates were not passed to or through lower lending rates. And now this heterogeneity is materially decreased. For example, loan rates in Italy and Spain have declined more than in Germany and France. The borrowing conditions for SMEs have improved. And the firm's demand for loans has increased considerably. And also very important, the NFC, the non-financial company's leverage, has gone down quite significantly. Finally, let me give you a final estimate of the impact of our monetary policy measures in the three years between 2016 and 2019. The accumulated impact of our policy measures is 1.7% on inflation, additional, being created by our policy measures, and 1.7% on growth. So that's, the, um, that's basically the assessment that inspired uh, the interventions of the Governing Council member, namely uh, acknowledge the success of our policy. The second block was the one that you just uh, heard me saying in the introductory statement, namely the appropriateness of the present monetary policy stance upon which these projections are based. So based on current information, the monetary policy stance that I've just uh, read in the introductory statement is considered appropriate by the Governing Council. And the third block was a discussion about risks, about the economic situation, how it has evolved. And again, there was a general recognition that the balance of risks has improved, as far, certainly as far as growth is concerned. So, following from this, the, it's, it's quite clear that the assessment of uh, certain scenarios that were considered very likely before is now telling us that these scenarios are going to become less likely. And that had some consequences in our language, namely, there was a sentence uh, which has been removed from my introductory statement that uh, used to say, if warranted to achieve its objective, the governing council will act by using all the instruments available within its mandate. You remember from the previous introductory statement, that's been removed. That's been removed 
because uh, basically to signal that uh, uh, there is no longer that sense of urgency in taking further actions while maintaining the accommodative monetary policy stance, including the forward guidance, but uh, that urgency that was prompted by the risks of deflation isn't there. That was the judgment, the assessment of the governing council. The second, uh, the second issue on which I would like to draw your attention is that, as you know, uh, the last Teltro, uh, the, the, the Teltro's list is going to expire, and there was no discussion about having another Teltro, not at all. Then we had a, a not an intense, but just a, a cursory discussion about whether to uh, remove the word lower from the forward guidance. Now, let me also, before I get to that, let me tell you what I said in, in this press conference in March 2016. I said, from today's perspective, and taking into account the support of our measures to growth and inflation, we don't anticipate that it will be necessary to reduce rates further. Of course, new facts can change the situation and the outlook. Since then, we frankly never discussed. So we had an exchange on that. Now I'm saying this because just to, to emphasize it's not a dramatic choice whether to keep or to remove it. But in the end, the governing council, given the fact that we can't yet say that we are there with a self-sustained inflation rate, prefer to keep this option in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the language, in the language. So we will continue to look through uh, changes in HICP inflation to the extent that they are transient and without implication for medium-term outlook for price stability. Thank you. Mr. Franco? Thank you very much, Andreas Franke from Reuters in Frankfurt. Uh, two questions, if I may, want to follow up on the TLTO you mentioned. Um, you said there were, was no discussion about the new uh, TLTO. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on this? Because uh, th th there was so much noise about it before this meeting that there uh, could be um, a new one. Uh, is this now? Is this tool now completely off off the table, or is it just? Uh, you, you put it back and see what's going on and perhaps in the next uh, few months it could happen or if you start tapering or exiting from the, from the QE could be a good option to, to safeguard liquidity in the future. The first question and the second one a bit, little bit more broader if I may. If you look at the CDS markets, the spreads are rising again. So that tells me and more and more market participants, analysts that markets are start betting again, again on a potential breakup of the Eurozone. How do you want to deal with this situation, especially given the fact that we have uh, many, many important political aspects on the way forward this year? Thank you. Thank you. Now, on the fact, on the first question, I only remarked that it was not discussed at all as a sign of the improved climate. And so there was no, no, no member of the governing council felt the need to even sort of uh, mention this. Having said that, we, uh, the, as, as very much in the spirit of our forward guidance, it's there and uh, it's potentially an instrument that could be used if, 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 the, if the economic situation will warrant that. In other words, there is, no, there is no ideological or institutional or legal obstacle to that. On, on the second point, uh, uh, well, frankly, I don't see that. I mean, there are, there, there are tensions, but uh, not, um, not anything that is, uh, is that serious. In any event, I've said it on and on. We are ready. The euro is irrevocable. Uh, and more than my words, it should be, we can discuss it further if you want, but it should be the commitment, exp first of all, it should be the experience we had by the euro. Incidentally, in the last uh, fall euro barometer, more than 70% of the people in the euro area are in favor of maintaining the euro. And this percentage is increasing. In the midst of the crisis, three countries joined the euro. 
The euro is being perceived as being the prerequisite of the single market. If there is no single market, there is no European Union. And countries, no matter what the views are, have greatly benefited from the single market. So all this speaks in, uh, in favor of, and especially also after the experience of 2012, of looking at these developments with great attention, but no anxiety. Ms. Jones? Mr. Draghi, you've, you've, you've noted a lot of um, reasons why to be upbeat, and yet my impression is that you're not convinced. So what would we need to see before you'd have this sort of high-class problem in which you would be willing to drop the commitment to further easing? Is it a case that we'd need to see a more neutral balance of risks, or should we be looking more specifically at the four criteria you've listed for inflation? And um, my second question, um, there seems to be a lot of speculation out there that you could raise rates before the end of QE, which clearly contradicts your opening statement, and yet the, the speculation seems to persist. So would it be possible for you to clarify whether you can see any circumstances under which you would raise rates before ending bond buying? Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, I simply reported on the discussion. It's not a matter of being convinced or not. The uh, one, thing, one thing that uh, one has to, to understand is that uh, uh, this is a gradual process. And um, the governing council members want to be convinced that they actually see a self-sustained adjustment in inflation rate. And we don't see it yet. I said it in the introductory statement. There are no convincing signs. Where is it? Well. Um, there are no convincing signs yet that underlying inflation is um, in any event, and, and the projections show this. So we see, we see progress on the recovery. What is it? Here, yeah. This reflected mainly strong, this higher headline inflation, strong increase in annual energy and unprocessed food, food price inflation with no signs yet of convincing upward trend in underlying inflation. So that is, uh, and, um, and so at the same time, the projections are conditional on the full implementation of the monetary policy measures that I have just, I've just read about. And it's a gradual process, I was saying. We, are, we have acknowledged the progress on the growth front, on the recovery front. And uh, we are pretty confident that as this will proceed, the slack will close, the labor market conditions will improve, and we'll start seeing that uh, wages growth, which is the linchpin of uh, a self-sustained growth in uh, increase in inflation. That is the, that is the, the, key, uh, the key variable that we should look at. It's not the only one, but it's certainly key. And so it's, it's not that one is uh, convinced or unconvinced all of a sudden. We, have to, we, we are progressing towards that objective. We are confident that we are progressing. And we see we can actually assess the success of our decisions through the numbers that I've just given you on growth, on employment, on credit markets, on financing, on inflation expectations. Thank you. Now, on the other point, I don't want to speculate. Now, the forward guidance, now it's this one. And current, and based on current information, that's what it is. It says that uh, until the going council, the interest rates will, um, net asset purchases are continue to continue a monthly pace of 60 billion or beyond if necessary. And uh, the, Uh, the interest rates, uh, um, where is it? Yeah, 
At the beginning it says, based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time. So it's, uh, I remark here, it's an expectation. We expect them to remain at present or lower levels. Now, as I said, the expectation, the probability of an expectation that will actually materialize into lower level has gone down, given what, uh, what I just said about, uh, about the rest, about the progress we've made. But uh, the foro guidance, uh, the Governing Council has decided to keep this foro guidance exactly as it stood before. Thank you. Mr. Fairless. Thank you, Tom Fairless from the Wall Street Journal. I had a question about the um, level of agreement within the Governing Council. Would you say that there's uh, more consensus today going out or, go, or continuing with uh, the stimulus than there was a couple of years ago when you were going into the uh, QE program. Um, because some, you know, some governing council members have, have expressed uh, uh, doubts about whether the current level of stimulus is too strong. Um, my second question is on uh, trade surpluses. The uh, new US administration has expressed concern about uh, surpluses in Germany. Uh, there's also a large surplus for the Eurozone as a whole. Um, do you think there's any merit in such uh, criticism? Uh, does this, do you think uh, Germany's and the Eurozone trade surplus res reflect some kind of imbalance um, that could have negative, a negative effect globally or for the Eurozone? Thanks. Let me respond to the second question first. I don't think there is any merit in, uh, in uh, attacking Germany. Uh, first, uh, let me say that, I, by the way, I have discussed this, I've answered the same question in the European Parliament, uh, when was that, two, three weeks ago. Uh, the currency of Germany is the euro, and the euro era's monetary policy is conducted by the ECB. The ECB is independent, as laid down in the European treaties and its statute. The exchange rate of the euro is determined by market forces, which is consistent with the long-standing commitment of the international community to market-determined exchange rates, as reiterated both the G7 and the G20 fora. In its latest report to Congress, released on October 14, 2016, the US Treasury itself stressed that Germany does not manipulate the currency. Treasury, let me give you the quotes, the Treasury has found in his report that no economy satisfied the criteria, including Germany, for being called a currency manipulator. Second quote, Germany has both a significant bilateral trade surplus with the United States and a current account surplus well above the material, the material threshold. But the European Central Bank has not intervened in foreign currency since 2011. And when we did it, we did it as part of a concerted intervention to, in order to stabilize the yen following Japan's earthquake and the tsunami. So that is the, I think, the answer to your point. Um, I can continue. I mean, if we look at, um, by the way, if we look at um, where the uh, effective exchange rate stands today, with respect to historical average, we don't see especially that the euro is off, off the historical average, uh, but the effective exchange rate of the dollar is off the historical average. And so it means that it's now the euro, the, uh, the culprit for this situation. Um, now, on your first question, you're asking me uh, how the consensus changes from time to time and meeting to meeting. I actually don't have a meter to measure that. I would say that the discussion today was pretty consensual. Uh, each position was stated. By and large, I think I gave you a fair account of what was discussed. Nuances might have been different, but I don't think that. And in any event, I am not able to compare the degree of consensus today with the degree of consensus last time. But you asked me an even more difficult question. You're asking me to remember what the consensus was two years or three years ago. That is, the bar is too high for me. Thank you. Mr. 
Mr. Daniels. Thank you, Harry Daniels from Live Scorp News. Um, it's a dual question, really. Firstly, the calls from European leaders. Uh, how does the ECB handle a multi-speed Europe, as we've heard from Hollande and uh, Chancellor Merkel of late? And secondly, just the trade-off uh, between the deposit rate and capital keys. We've seen some distortions, in the, specifically in the German market, over the last uh, three weeks at the short end. And I just wondered how the ECB would uh, react to that. Well, on the first, uh, on the first point, I, I really don't have much to say. It's an entirely wholly political judgment here. There is clearly in the need to 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 work more together, because the nature of the problems that uh, have presented them to 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 the European countries are all of them, I would say, supranational problems. So they can be successfully coped only together. Now, given that the political situations in different countries are different, uh, it may well happen the countries are not equally ready to move together towards uh, working together. And so I guess that's where the, the, the reference to multi-speed Europe come comes from. The acknowledgement that a certain group of countries, either because they perceive that their problems are more clo closer to, to their own entity, or because they are more willing to work together, are readier than others to do this. And uh, so my understanding of this is, uh, is that uh, whatever arrangement could be found, and it's not clear yet which specific area would be addressed by this arrangement, but whatever arrangement is, could be found is gonna be an open arrangement, namely ready to welcome any other country that would like to join. Uh, but I, 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 I don't know, I mean, I don't know enough about the specificities of this, uh, of this statement to, to elaborate more than that. Perhaps I would know more tonight. Um, on the, the other point is, um, it's about the distortions in the German market. Yes, we've observed and we are monitoring them quite closely. Uh, and we asked ourselves what could be the reasons, the causes for this, uh, for these, um, for these interest rate movements. Um, we are in a quite preliminary stage of our analysis. So what I'm going to tell today is, is just very provisional. Uh, there are several causes. One is that certainly uh, the German short-term bonds are, in more, more generally, all the German bond market is viewed as a safe haven. And so there have been flows towards this, uh, this market, and there has been what we call flight to quality phenomenon as well. But if we limit our attention to the short-term segment, on top of that, we see that uh, the German short-term bonds are equivalent to uh, putting money in the deposit facility. And so the share of those who don't have access to the deposit facility invest into German bonds, short-term bonds, and this share of people has gone up. And that's why we have low yields in the cash bond market on the short term, uh, but not in the repo market because investors are different. And the other cause, of course, is our purchase program. But to assess the relative weight is still too early. I think the, the second cause, the first two causes seem to be pretty relevant, pretty significant, perhaps more significant than our asset purchase program. But, uh, but just to, perhaps we, we want to come back on this next time to have a definite view on that. Mr. Akagawa. I'm Shogo Akagawa, Japanese Nikkei, and I have two questions. One question is about economic outlook. I mean, and growth and inflation both are levered upwards today. Um, what was today's risk assessments about fragile transatlantic relationship or the coming election in the Eurozone? And the second question is again about the currency manipulations uh, discussion. And because the, um, 
G20 meeting will be held next week in Baden-Baden in Germany. What kind of discussion are you expecting? Are you expecting any changes of G20 commitments or consensus in terms of exchange rate or banking regulations? Thank you. Well, thank you. The, um, in, our, uh, in our introductory statement, there is a reference to geopolitical risks of geoglobal risks. Or, uh, but I'm saying this because that's certainly a relevant risk source that uh, we've taken into account in our discussion. Uh, if, we, if one wants to sort of assess the balance of risk as it has been evolving over, the, say, the five, six months, we would say that the domestic sources of risk have been more contained. The importance of domestic risk has decreased. And the geopolitical global risk share of importance, if anything, has gone up. That is, uh, that is a fair assessment. Although we've got to be very, very careful about this assessment because our experience of the last year and a half has been that uh, we, we were expecting uh, some uh, significant economic impact from the various risks that have been materialized. And you remember the Brexit, you remember the Italian referendum, you remember the new US administration, now we have the elections in Europe. Now these risks, have some of them have, uh, have materialized, but we haven't seen yet a significant economic impact. So we are all asking ourselves uh, when, uh, there, are, there are certain risks that are unambiguously negative. We know that certain, uh, certain of these events, and I don't want to point out which one, uh, will produce in the medium term a negative consequence. But uh, so far, we've been, so almost a year and a half has passed from the British referendum, and we, perhaps, I'm not sure I'm right, but uh, about, Eight months, nine, nine months, yes, and we haven't seen yet uh, yet a, a consequence. So we have to be sort of, we, have, we know that these are risky events. We don't know yet how these risky events will reverberate on the economic situation. Uh, on the second question, well, I think it's important to reiterate the commitments that uh, were undertaken by our leaders and by our finance ministers. Let me just read the one of uh, uh, the last one was on July 24, 2016, by the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors in Shandu. We reiterate that excessive volatility and disorderly movements in exchange rates can have adverse implications for economic and financial stability. We will consult closely on exchange markets. We reaffirm our previous exchange rate commitments, including that we will refrain from competitive devaluations and we will not target our exchange rates for competitive purposes. Now, a statement like this, or statements to this, uh, to this extent, have been the pillar of the stability that has accompanied world growth in the last uh, 20 years and longer. So it's very important that this commitments of this commitments of this type are being reaffirmed. Mr. Bondeman. Thank you. Uh, Mark Bonerman for Dutch newspaper NRC Handelsblad. Um, Mr. Draghi, um, can I ask, has the governing council today discussed uh, an exit from the QE program? And um, in line with that, has the governing council discussed uh, the language in the statement saying uh, we stand ready to increase our asset purchase program in terms of size and or duration? Thank you. Uh, no, no, we haven't discussed either, uh, either point, but especially, I mean, but, but by and large, 
if I can repeat what I said before, the original formulation of the forward guidance maintained a certain amount of flexibility just in case certain very negative scenarios were to materialize. From today's perspective, based on the information we have today, these scenarios have become more unlikely to materialize. Thank you. Mr. Ewing. Uh, Jack Ewing, New York Times. Uh, Mr. Draghi, you've, um, there was some discussion of the political situation a few minutes ago. I wonder if I could come back to that. There's a number of elections coming up this year. Um, a number of the, in most of the countries, there's a candidate who is anti-Euro or Euro-skeptic. Uh, it sounded a minute ago like you were pretty relaxed about that. Am I reading you right, or is this something that you're worried about, and does it play any role in uh, your discussions? Um, and uh, secondly, on, on the uh, G20, I just wonder, is this, am I correct, this will be your first meeting with any members of the new presidential, the new US administration, and I'm just wondering if you have any agenda or message for them. Thank you, no, you, you are correct, um, you are correct, and um, no, not really, I mean, just our, our, um, our mandate is relatively narrow if compared to the broadness of the issues that are gonna be discussed by the finance ministers. Uh, we, we have, we operate, we work, and we craft our international position based on pursuing our mandate of price stability. So even in international fora, we look at what conditions internationally are supportive of price stability. So I don't have any uh, message at this point in time. I'm certainly uh, confident the discussion will be fruitful. Now on your first point, uh, let me be clear. Um, if we go back uh, to when the euro was created, there have always been people who said, oh, it's wrong, it's a mistake, it cannot be done. And um, there have been, they still were saying the same during the life of the euro, and they are saying the same today. Now, all this, I find this position, and that will tell you in, what, in which way I'm concerned. In other words, not so much by the market developments, which I said before, we, uh, we look and monitor with attention, but without anxiety. Um, but uh, in a different way, the euro, I was saying before, has been the cornerstone, the pillar upon which the single market could survive and could prosper and could increase prosperity of the member countries. So without single market, there is no European Union. So that's why it's unrealistic to think anything different from the Euro. And now, especially now, that we face, all European countries face uh, geopolitical challenges, terrorism, migration, security challenges, the euro is a, a channel for solidarity across its, some of its members. And the leaders have expressed their clear intention to work together. I recall before that even in the midst of a crisis, three countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, joined the euro. And that was, of course, because of the direct benefits that such membership could bring, but also because of a sense of solidarity that such a membership would entail. So, to cut it short, the euro is here to stay. Uh, if, so the question is not so much if it's irrevocable, it is. But then a more productive line of thinking would be how do we make sure that we can increase prosperity, make it function better, this monetary union? And uh, in the course of its history, you can see that many things have been done. Now we tend to un always, in facing critical moments, we tend to underplay the, our, our achievements in the past. But in fact, if you look at the Stability and Growth Pact, if you look at the SSM, if you look at the ESM, 
If you look at the um, extraordinary shows of solidarity that countries have shown towards its members that were crossing, were having, were, were being in a state of crisis. And on the other, on the other side, you, you can also recall the extraordinary efforts of the countries that were in a program. So all this tells us that the commitment of the European, of the European and Euro, Euro member countries' leaders to, to the Euro is, uh, is, uh, is very, very strong. And um, so we should ask ourselves, what can we do better to make the Euro more resilient, stronger, in facing a crisis. And of course we've been, you know, you know the way the ECB thinks about that, but there are many other, many other routes. And uh, I think that uh, today, more than ever, the situation is open to further progress. It's quite clear, it has to be, to be made more resilient. I think everybody would agree with that. Uh, Ms. Trick. Johanna Trig, Politico, thank you very much. Um, I've got two questions. Um, you know, you, you pointed out yourself earlier that um, the central bank has quite a narrow mandate, but it seems to me that a statement, uh, the statement to say that the, the euro is irrevocable is quite a political statement. Um, or do you consider it as part of your mandate to, to keep the currency union or the, the euro alive? Um, that's the one question. My second question is, it sounded like you're more optimistic on, on the economic outlook. Um, and I wonder why that is not reflected in your um, inflation forecast for 2019. Thank you very much. Uh, responding to the second question, um, we are more, as you say, to use your words, more optimistic about the growth forecast. We have to see how these improved prospects as far as growth is concerned and recovery and strengthening and broadening of the recovery, as I've said before, translate into higher headline inflation into an inflation that satisfies the four features that were uh, mentioned at the beginning, namely convergence through to our objective of an inflation rate which is uh, close but below 2%, that is a durable convergence, namely in the medium term, so not transient. That is self-sustained, in other words, a convergence that can stay there without this extraordinary monetary accommodation that's in place. And of course, an inflation rate that is such for uh, this objective for all countries and not one country only. So we haven't seen yet how this better prospects have translated. And the reason why we haven't seen, I mentioned it before, it's that we haven't seen yet any significant development on the wages front. Uh, that is the, um, the key point. I think, it's, as I said, it's not the only point, but it's one important element of our assessment. Um, now, on, on the other point, you may imagine this question was asked to me, was asked uh, at the time of the OMT, at the time of the London speech in 2012, no, I mean, the, the mandate of the ECB stays what it is, namely pursue price stability and making sure that conditions in which our work to pursue price stability is going to be successful. Not more than that. Thank you. Ms. Weisbach. Annette Weisbach, CNBC. Um, may I bring you back to the G20? <clears throat> How important is that for you, that there will be a bold statement against protectionist measures? Um, because there are reports that this might actually be dropped from the communique. And also, uh, the point which you made earlier, there might be a dropping of the point of the competitive devaluation uh, point in the communique. How important is that to you, that we are going to see that for the world community? Another question is a bit more technical. On, uh, there are also concerns that already by now there's not enough bonds to buy for small countries like Portugal, for example. Um, how are you going to address that problem going forward during the course of this year, given we keep on having the asset purchase program around at the current speed? Thank you. Well, answering your second question, uh, our bond purchase program is, uh, is on track is on track both time-wise and quantity-wise. 
So we have no reason to, uh, to um, be worried about, about this at this point in time. Now, uh, on, on the, other, the other point is, um, well, it's actually quite important. It's for, uh, I, I was commenting before on the commitments that uh, were um, concerning the exchange rates. But I think I can say the same about the commitments of keeping an open trade. They have been the pillars of uh, world prosperity for many, many years, many decades. And so it's quite important that G20 reaffirm this commitment. And frankly, I mean, I don't know about these rumors. I, I know of the rumors, but I don't know what to say about that, where they come from, whether it's true or not. Thank you. And with this, we will close the press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.